Shall we invite him? Give him. Thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you. Uh, friends, thank you for having me. It, it's a real honor to be with you. When Ebby asked me to do this a while back, I was like, oh, well, how would you want to hear from me? Um, but I am very grateful. Um, they have done such great research and been so very intentional about their preparation and their vision for church planning. Their research has helped us tremendously. So to explain some of those different roles, I'm a pastor at First Presbyterian Church. Well, first I'm a husband to Jody and a father to Alexandra, senior in high school, Charles, a junior in high school, and Brooks, a crazy wild fifth grader. Uh, so I've been in a pastor role for 22 years now, the last 17 of which in Orlando in evangelism. And our church's ministry of faith and work is called The Collaborative. The Collaborative. That is our church's faith and work ministry, modeled after Tim Keller's work in New York at Redeemer Presbyterian Church. Um, you can go to collaborativeorlando.com to see more about that. And then finally, he mentioned Made to Flourish. It is a network of pastors interested in faith and work type ministry. So um, of all those different hats, though, I'm just honored to be Abby and East Esther's friend. And thank you for having me. So if you will, take your Bibles, and we're going to first look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And as you turn to that, let us pray. Father, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for the beauty and the power of your word and ask that you would come and be with us and that your words uh, would come through to mine. In Christ's name, amen. So Paul in Rome in his latter days, in his prison cell, writing to the Christians of Colossae. And wouldn't you know, Ebby's going to give me, of all the most challenging of passages, this on slaves and masters. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and with reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Behind this door, behind this door sits my master, Philemon. Behind this door, my future could be determined very quickly for good or for bad. I could go through that door and, and, and I could hear Philemon say, Onesimus, out of my house. You have disgraced me. You see, I, I ran away many, many months ago. I ran away to the great city of Rome to seek and to beg for the assistance of the great apostle, the apostle Paul. You see, Philemon gathers the Christians of our city here in Colossae, and we go to his home every week for prayer prayer and for worship. And I had heard Philemon time and again mention the name of this great man, Paul, the one who had actually shared the gospel with him and led him to the Lord Jesus as Messiah. 
while Paul had never actually visited our little town, he had clear influence over Philemon. And so I thought, well, this great man, Apostle Paul, would be able to influence him. I kind of got the sense that Philemon and Paul would, would visit over the years after his conversion, whenever Paul was passing through Ephesus or Philadelphia. Philemon owes this Apostle Paul a great debt, for sure, having introduced him to Jesus. So I thought, well, if I will go see Paul, who's in prison, then he might write and tell Philemon to set me free, to let me be out of his service. If anyone would listen to if Philemon would listen to anyone, it would be Paul. Well, another reason I, I thought I would go to Rome is because our pastor, Epaphras, had just left a few weeks before me, and he went to actually minister to Paul and to help take care of some of his needs. Well, so Epaphras' departure gave me this idea I'll follow after him. And if there, maybe Epaphras could help to convince Paul to tell Philemon to set me free. Problem was, though, Paul was all the way over in Rome. <laughs> in Rome, a long way from my village of Colossae. The journey down the mountains onto a ship harbor to harbor to harbor, all the way around until we get to the port for Rome and up into the capital city. I mean, this million-person city, I, I'd never seen so many buildings, so many people. The majesty of the Roman Empire, it was, it, I was overwhelmed, but I was also exhausted and sick from the long journey. But it, it, at least I made it alive. So I I asked around, and I finally found a Epaphras, and I was taken to meet the Apostle Paul. They, they took me to meet with him. Now, I knew when I got there, surely he would understand the situation. Surely. And, and surely Epaphras would speak into the situation about especially Philemon's lazy son, Archippus, <laughs> who had gotten really lackadaisical about leading the church and some of the weird beliefs and practices he was pushing. But, but when I got there, the apostle was more interested in the greater health of the church, the greater dynamics of our fellowship, and another funny thing happened when I got there. Rather than Paul writing Philemon a letter to tell him to let me go free, rather than Paul helping me strategize a way to get out of his service, or, I don't know, just running away in the middle of the night, but I didn't want to be a fugitive. But rather than entertain those various options, Paul then started focusing on, on me. And he would say things, Onesimus, do you love God? Onesimus, how are you trying to love God? Where is the role of the law in your life? But where is the life of the spirit and i was like no no no, no paul we, we've got to focus on philemon and we got to figure out how to get me out of his service and yet paul kept focusing on my heart and about whether i knew about jesus as messiah and about the incredible grace that this jesus has shown well sure enough over time paul convinced me that sure that jesus was the messiah sure and Soon enough, I mean, I, I would worship with the Christians there in Rome in their house worship. And then one day, the Holy Spirit fell on me. And I knew so very differently what I knew to be true 
I knew things about God. I confess Jesus more than Messiah, but Lord over all, and was soon thereafter baptized. I don't know how it happened. I mean, I went to appeal to Paul for my freedom, and I got freedom for my heart, freedom for my whole life. Well, then the harder part came. (laughs) Wouldn't you know? Didn't get any easier. Because Paul told me, he said, Onesimus, you got to go back to Colossae. And you got to reconcile with Philemon. (laughs) What? You've got to be kidding me. But he told me, yeah, go back home. Go reconcile with your master and, and hope that he shows you mercy and grace and acceptance. And that's what I'm to find out behind this door. Will he show me mercy and grace and acceptance? He may not. And that really worries me. But Paul gave me these two letters to take back with me. There's this cover letter to Philemon. And then Paul put in another letter for all of the house churches in our area for it to be read. And, well, I'll tell you, I opened it and read it. We don't want Philemon to know this. And okay, I shouldn't have, but it was just too tempting, right? All of those months of travel to get back to Colossae from harbor to harbor, and and I had them with me, and and I just knew in here, Paul was going to set the stage for me, but Paul was going to say something maybe about me to Philemon. Well, I have to admit, it really looks good for me. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I came out pretty good, and, and it's so cool how F- Paul is trying to appeal to Philemon's good side as a boss, as a master. It's the great apostle Paul appealing to Philemon on my behalf, little old me. I mean, Paul is such a good and a savvy writer, like, should have known, right? And so he knows how to deal with powerful wealthy men like Philemon. And so what? He compliments him right off the bat. Let me go and read this some to you. Paul says to Philemon, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. (laughs) Right? Right? Because, Philemon, I, I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus for all the saints. All right. Go, Paul. Go, Paul. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing, like forgiving Onesimus, for the sake of Jesus Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Oh yeah, Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. Flatter him a little bit, build him up, let him know of all the good things he's doing. But, but, but listen to some of the rest of this. Because Paul carefully walks a line between his great authority as the apostle, as the very one who even brought Philemon to faith. He walks a line between that and between appealing to Philemon for my forgiveness and to do so on the basis of love. And on the basis of what Jesus would have done, he writes, Therefore, though I am bold enough to command you what to do and is what is required. All right, pull a little power punch there, right? Though I could tell you what to do. You ever done that with your kids? Yet, for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, am an old man and now a prisoner for Christ Jesus. 
I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus. whose father I became in imprisonment. He's my father. As a boy caught up in a battle in Arabia, I've been passed around from house to house to house as a servant. I don't even remember my real father. Philemon wasn't a cruel man, isn't a cruel man, but he certainly didn't pretend to be my father. Formerly, Philemon, Onesimus was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you. I'm sending my very heart calls me his son. He calls me his very heart. Did, did you catch, though, that, that little pun? That, that you didn't catch the play on words in the Greek? Well, see, my name Onesimus in Greek, it means useful or profitable. But Paul writes right here, formerly he was useless to you, right? And now he's useful to you, right? Right? Like, yeah, you think Philemon will get it? I mean, besides the fact that, hey, Philemon, you may have thought I was just a servant in your house, and really the housework is kind of useless because it's going to get dirty again. But, oh, now Onesimus is a son of the king, is a child of the covenant, and now joins you arm in arm in the building of the kingdom in Colossae. Oh, how much more useful Is he to you? I'm your brother in the Lord now, Philemon. Yes, you're still my master. And that relationship is there, but it's secondary to now. We're not just co-laboring in the running of the house. We're co-laboring in the economy of God and seeing the kingdom built in and through who you are who we are, and what this operation is all about. And think of the witness I'll have to others in my station of life and the freedom that they truly have in the Messiah Jesus. Now, Paul told me it was actually going to be at this very moment right here in front of this door that was going to be the hardest. And, And I think he's right. See, Paul said, Onesimus, Satan is going to hound you all the way back home and plant lies in your head and in your heart and make you fearful and scared of what Philemon might do. And sure enough, there were plenty of times at various port cities where I thought, I can run. I can just go. Yes, I'll be a fugitive, but maybe I I, I could just go. But Paul was right that even with Satan hounding me, it's standing here right before this door, that the intensity will get harder than ever before. And he said to me, Onesimus, you must be obedient and greet your earthly master as your spiritual brother. So here I stand, ready, ready to be useful for kingdom work, for earthly work. Here I stand. Friends, historians tell us that Onesimus went on to become the bishop of the neighboring metropolis of Ephesus. So we think Philemon must have welcomed him, must have forgiven him, 
must have perhaps at that point turned into a father figure or allowed for a lifelong journey of discipleship such that Onesimus grows in leadership and becomes the bishop, the papa, the father of the house churches in one of the largest cities in the eastern Mediterranean. Historians also suggest that Bishop Onesimus was the first to put out the call to all the churches to send in copies of their letters written by Paul. Because he wanted to collect them. He wanted to preserve them. Makes sense, doesn't it? This man who had such profound influence on Onesimus' life, he wanted to honor him by recording things. And if you look at your table of contents in your Bibles, you'll notice the order of Paul's letters. Bishop Onesimus actually put them in that order, except with one change. He put Paul's letter to the Ephesians first. Makes sense. You put your home church first, right? Chippard put the letter to New City Gainesville first. Later, Marcion switches the order and puts Galatians at the first, we think perhaps because of its dogmatic intensity, which reflected Marcion's personality. And there at the end of the Pauline collection, Bishop Onesimus includes the letter to Philemon that saved both his life spiritually and physically. This story of Philemon and Onesimus is replete with faith and work issues. If you think through your role in the workplace, there is your physical responsibility, there is your spiritual responsibility, there is your company's Responsibility for the goods and services it provides. And hopefully, as is increasingly popular, there is a responsibility towards your workforce, towards the community, towards the environment, what more and more folks are calling the triple or the quadruple bottom line. Not just the bottom line of profitability, but the bottom line that includes care of your clients, your workforce, your community, and the environment. There are all sorts of other issues in this very story. The dynamic of being co-workers for the economy and co-laborers, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3.9, in the economy of God. The whole dynamic of living one's faith through the cycle of death, resurrection, and glory. Not only as we die to ourselves, we are resurrected in Christ and we live under his glory in our initial salvation, but how we die to ourselves idols each and every day and every week. And as we are resurrected by the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, and we are to be set free and to live into his glorious living, but also the way in which do we at work die to ourselves and get resurrected and live into his glory in our coworker relationships in our subordinates, in our bosses. But how might we push that even further, especially for those of you who might be small business owners, hiring managers, vice presidents with a degree of power that you think about, how is my company dying to itself? How is my company identifying its shortcomings, its idols, its temptations, its immoral mistakes? How is it being resurrected through Embracing, if not the word of God explicitly, at least the common good values that are good and replete through scripture for all of humanity in God's common grace. And how are we living into a glorious new future? Onesimus and Philemon are addressed even in Paul's letter to the greater church. That chapter 3, verse 22, whatever you do, whether you're the boss or the servant, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Now, a caveat and a word must be said, especially here in America after our 500 years of abusing entire populations of people in horrific slavery. 
The slavery of this day was very different. It was not racism-based. It had its moments for sure, but not near as horrific in the degree of ownership. Often, servants and slaves were held for a season or were captured by an army and then released after a season. But even there were many instances of human indignity. Some will say that Paul is not pushing hard enough to set his people free, as Martin Luther King Jr. did, as the great abolitionist movement by evangelicals in America did. But we cannot go back and judge Paul for the human rights perspective that we carry today on this side of the enlightenment of, liberal, of classical liberalism, of the United Nations understanding of the Declaration of Human Rights. Rather, Paul seeks not to go after systemic issues, but to the personal, and to call the master to be a generous, good man, and to call the servant to be faithful, regardless of the perspective. Now, we need to do all we can in the church to work against human trafficking and enslavement. In the meantime, we can draw from this our role wherever we are in a workplace hierarchy and how it is that we are living out our call as Christ followers and our responsibility to seek the common good in and through the work that we do. Friends, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Now, I'd like to open things up a bit, if we may, and do a little bit of conversation, and even for questions that you may have. I'd like to first ask, take your sheet of paper and a pen, and we're going to take about two minutes, maybe three, and I want you to identify as many faith and work topics as you can in my monologue in this story of Philemon and Onesimus. Write down as many faith and work situations or questions that came to your mind or keep coming to your mind that could be drawn from this one story. as many faith and work situations as may come about in this story. Boss and worker, worker to co-worker, outside authorities to a boss in a workplace. What is the common product they were working on? How was that expanded? What are the implications for bringing a kingdom vision into a earthly workplace. Jot down as many faith and work topics as you can imagine that emerge in that story, answered or unanswered. Okay, about 20 more seconds. Okay, now look at your list. Look over your list and circle the one that you think is the strongest or most unique. Think about most unique, because everybody in here is going to have a lot of the same ones, but you're different. You're special. Okay, I'd love to have you share them with me. Um, let's lift up a bunch, and then we'll go back and, and dive into a few. So who would like to share with me one of your elements you see in this story?
Just raise your hand or shout it out. Yes, sir. Okay, good. We can't run away necessarily from hard workplaces. Give me another one. Thank you. That's great. Yes, sir. Awesome. By coming back, there is a job bigger than before, and glory is given to God. That's great. I love when others see things here that I didn't even see. What else? Say that for me one more time. Yeah. Good. And you reminded me, um, I did not open with my normal joke, that some call him Philemon, but we in Georgia call him Philemon. What other ob observations do you see in this passage? Mm. So how a Christian leader should treat someone as brothers, as co-laborers. Co-laborers, by the way, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 is where we get the term the collaborative, the co-labor, the collaborative effort as we build out faith and work ministry. Yeah, but how Christian leaders should treat someone as brothers, as co-laborers. And it's tricky, isn't it? Finding that balance between I got to be boss i got to advance this forward. i got to correct some of your growing edges. I've got to help you get on board with the team. We've got to be profitable. But then also, you're a friend, and I love you. Perhaps you need to expand a definition of love, because love isn't just meaning all nice fuzzy wuzzies. Um, I was speaking with the pastor here, Chipper, beforehand, and they've acquired this wonderful building. Well, now they have tenants in other spaces, and he's become a landlord. <laughs> and... Can you be a pastor and a landlord? Well, yeah, you can. How does each perhaps look a little different or meld into one? Okay, good. All right, ladies, don't let all the men get all the answers in now. So Paul trusted him for a second chance. Yes. That's good. Let's get two more. Two more faith and work issues or dynamics you see in this story.
who is doing the role of Paul today? Mm. So good. We'll come back to that. Yeah, Esther. Dr. Esther. Yeah, so Paul acts in his letter towards Philemon with some degree of knowledge of how it's going to turn out. But what if he knew Philemon was a low-down, dirty dog and was not going to be so kind and caring? What if Onesimus came from a random household that Paul didn't even know about and the boss was not at all a Christian? Would Paul's advice have changed? Okay, one more. Anybody over here? Yes, ma'am. How shall Philemon treat the other slaves? Boy, that's a tricky one. I'll never forget sitting in a church personnel committee meeting and we were at the point of terminating someone, sadly. And another person said, well, um, you can't do that. That's not equal to the other employees. And a very short-tempered elder slammed his hands on the table and he went, we don't treat everybody equally. We treat everybody fairly. And that really, hmm, there's a difference. Friends, you're in so many different contexts, I can't even imagine. But I am moved by someone who was in one of our vocational guilds. A vocational guild is one of the curricula we offer through the collaborative. You are more than welcome to have it and use it if you would like. A vocational guild is a gathering of individuals from the same industry to work through a six-week curriculum on the theology of work. And our premise is, at the collaborative, that we as Christ followers, especially as a culture, that even we as Christ followers operate out of a very shallow and poor theology of work. Especially in light of the book of Colossians 1, in which Christ is not at the center And if Christ is at the center, what else and what more does that mean? For the last 30 years, there have been wonderful ministries called marketplace ministries that have asked that question about Christ at the center, but they've come out in two particular places, good places, but there's more. Those two places have been in ethics and evangelism, that I need to be a good moral person at work, I need to turn in my receipts correctly and be nice to other people. And then evangelism, I need to help bring my co-worker to Christ. I need to leave my Bible on the desk so they'll ask me why it's there. Those are good things, and we need marketplace ministries to continue. But our work at the collaborative and sort of this next generation of the marketplace movement is asking the bigger question about Christ in the midst of all things related to vocational calling. And in vocational calling, we know if Christ, as you heard earlier, is in the work of redemption from creation to fall, redemption and restoration. How is he redeeming the common good in and through our goods and services, in and through our workplaces? So there are so many various contexts for you. A vocational guild helps you to dig into your context and really ask the question about work and what are the um, things that have guided me into thinking about work, whether good or bad, how do I correct, replace, or renew a theology of work with scripture, with good doctrine, with um, a fellowship of believers who are working out their salvation in this theology of work. And um, we've also discovered that bringing industry-specific people together for this experience is valuable. 
But we've also recently discovered, and we're going to test this a bit more, small companies using the curriculum for their team building, where you are the boss, or at least you as a hiring manager, uh, a VP, have a great deal of latitude and influence. Your faith can be known and expressed through your workplace. And so this curriculum has helped one particular community bank uh, train and encourage its employees who um, very clearly know the owners of the community bank are Christ-centered and want to do um, Christ-centered kind of work. So wherever you may be in an organization, these issues are myriad, but there's filters and ways to work through that. Now, another one here that I wanted to speak to that Esther brought up, who's doing the role of Paul today? Perhaps you've heard it said, and I like it, where... Um, uh, you, everybody needs in their life a Barnabas, a Paul, and a Timothy. A Barnabas, an, an older mentor, uh, Paul, who is, or no, Paul is an older mentor, Barnabas is a peer, and a Timothy to pour into. And so, especially if you're a business owner, um, I find as a pastor, uh, my senior pastor is a wonderful man and we're good friends, but I have chosen and sought out other elders to be mentors. And I want to encourage you, wherever you are in an organization, who are those mentors pouring into you and pouring into your workplace situations? They're best not to be in your same workplace. They could, just understanding the power dynamics there. It might be good to have an older, wise individual who is um, in a similar industry so they understand the dynamics. But ultimately, at the end of the day, the mentoring relationship works up. It doesn't work down. Churches have tried all sorts of uh, mechanisms and programs where they get mentors paired up with younger people and um, it just gets a little awkward and weird because at the end of the day the person with the power and the wisdom may not necessarily want to give their time or feel comfortable navigating the awkwardness and weirdness especially if the relationship doesn't work out so I've always observed that the mentor relationship works up when you go to someone older and wiser than you and you seek them out and you hound them in a beautiful, appropriate way. It flatters them. If they don't want to be bothered or to do that role, you'll get that sense real quick. And you can then um, go find this important role that you need in your life, but especially your Christian life, in a way that it suits and fills your valley. So pursue a Christ-centered mentor in your work. In our last few minutes here, I just want to make myself available for any questions you might have, either about faith and work ministry in general, or about the theology of work and how we are to, in whole life discipleship, see our faith expressed through it all. Questions, comments? You mean take some of the observations about the thing earlier in the question? Yeah. Well, what if my boss is not a believer? <laughs> the word vocation comes from the Latin word vocare, which means calling. So the word vocation comes from the Latin word vocare, V-O-C-A-R-E accent, which means calling. And there's a woman in our church named Tammy who has been a great leader and helper of mine in the collaborative. And um, I'm going to stand under the air conditioner. Um, Tammy is retired and spent her career in the hospitality industry 
first with Hampton Inn Hotels, then Holiday Inn Expresses. She opened all of those, and then her last 20 years with Red Lobster, and did all the training for everybody in the Red Lobster store, from the waitress, bus boys to the chefs, managers. And Tammy says, for most of my Christian life as a working woman, I kept my Christianity quiet and from my coworkers because they would have thought I was nuts. And she said, and when I went to church, I kept my role as a career woman away from my church friends because of the pressure in her particular context in the South where if I wasn't staying home with the kids, then I had made the wrong choice. And she said, it took me a long time to begin to integrate those two. And the thing that helped me was to understand vocation and calling. And she said, vocation is far and above more than what you get paid to do. We use the word vocation as that for which we get income and a paycheck. And she said, I had to figure out first, what's my calling in life? And then, how do I make money by doing it? And how else does it get lived out in my life? And she has a great, pithy little one-liner statement on her vocation, her calling in life. I wish I could remember to tell you. It's something along the lines of, to help individuals maximize their gifts for the service of others in the common good. Something like that. And she said, now, I was one of the few. This is kind of the American dream, but very few of us actually get to get paid for what we love to do, for what our passion is. That's a whole talk in and of itself. But she said, I did, by the end of my career, figure out I do that sort of thing, helping individuals maximize their gifts for the common good, in 25 different ways. And I get paid uh, in, in one, or one of those particular ways. And so now in her post-income years, you know, the R word's not in the Bible. Retirement. The R word is not in the Bible. So if we're going to be biblical, we shouldn't talk about retirement. We talk about our post-income years when your vocational calling is still unfolding. And I love how my senior pastor here in Orlando with a whole lot of retirees, yeah, uh, we have uh, uh, snowbirds. Do you know what a snowbird is? Someone who lives up north but comes south for the winter. Um, he routinely stands in the pulpit and says, if you're here to play golf and collect shells, then go find another church. Because God's got a lot more for you to do than to sit around and collect golf shells and play golf in your post-income years. Well, she now, back to Tammy, the elder, beautifully and wonderfully works out her calling in and through now volunteer work, consulting, mentoring, and, and those sorts of things. So what do you do when your boss is not a believer? First, you've got to be very clear on what your vocation is. What is my vocation? More than my job, because it's easy to leave a job. Well, it's not easy, but it's a lot easier to leave a job than to change your vocation. And I have found a number of folks who are very clear about their vocation as God gives it can learn mechanisms and ways to endure a boss. Now, you may have a non-believing boss who's wonderful. There's plenty of great non-believing bosses. You could have a Christian boss who is a pain in the rear and annoying and obnoxious. Certainly, that happens. But whether your non-Christian boss is a believer or non-believer, a healthy, enjoyable person to work for or not, one's vocational calling has got to be the center of that relationship to then be the bellwether as to whether this is where I need to be and where God wants me to be. Number two, looking at the ends of the product or the service you're providing. What are the ends in society? Is it building up the common good? Now, a lot of times, folks have a hard time seeing that because when you are way down in a massive system and you're knocking out widgets that somebody else might could knock out or doesn't really uh, connect to the end, um, you need help doing that. And your pastor can help, a mentor can help, but I have found it so much more helpful in one's vocational calling to know that what I do allows that to happen, that to happen, that to happen, and then this communal good to make things more beautiful, more just, more right. 
And if you can't see it, well, then either try to see it or reconsider vocational calling. Reconsider where you are and how you can move towards that. Finally, my encouragement would be if you have a non-believing boss, particularly one who is not into scripture, not into a Christian worldview, there are, um, I don't want to use the word secular because I don't like secular. There are non-Christian parallel terms for every single Christian parallel term. Okay? So you want to pursue a holy lifestyle. Well, I want to do good in the world. Right? Um, I want to use my gifts. That would even be acceptable in the culture today. I want to use my gifts. Um, I am called to pursue the kingdom of God through myself, my family, my neighborhood, my workplace. Well, I want to pursue the common good. So you can find non-Christianese to parallel every one of these values, and that is one thing that a lot of even Christian business owners do because they don't want to create an environment in which their employees feel pressured on the Jesus front. They want them to know that they're welcome and they're trying to walk a fine line with HR rules, etc. So how can you think about and claim such vocabulary to then work with coworkers or a boss uh, regardless of their end game and perspective? And then finally, I just say you're always a witness. You're always on trial. That's a negative way to put it. You're always being watched. You're always a witness. And um, make sure that your witness is worthy of the gospel. Any other big ideas, questions you may have about this passage, what we've looked at, or even faith and work ministry? I want to commend you for coming here. I think it's fantastic that you care about such things. Um, I want to commend Ebby and Esther and their vision for church planning and to see faith and work ministry grow. They are a worthy and commendable investment for seeing kingdom work happen. So keep this relationship strong, stay in touch with them, and keep leaning in in your own lives and working on your own faith with fear and trembling because it'll just draw you closer to Jesus and help your own work be so much more fulfilling. Let me pray for y'all. Father, thank you for this conference, for the time that these men and women have together, for the beauty of their precious children. Um, I ask that you would break down some walls, uh, help lead them into some repentance, but also to quickly taste and see how very good and real you are. Lord, I pray for Ebby and Esther and for their church planting vision and desire for their growth of ministry that nurtures and encourages and, and touches so many. So continue to support them and draw them into even greater fields that we know are white for harvest. Bless us this day. Bless our lunch. May it fill us well and our conversations reflect your goodness and grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.